I'm back in 1 Timothy chapter 3. We've made it through looking at 1 through 7 on the characteristics of a pastor, characteristics that you want in a pastor. Now we made it to verse 8, and it's going to be about characteristics you want in a deacon. So it says, Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. So a deacon, what's a deacon? A deacon is a servant, a helper, an extension of the pastor's ministry. So since they're an extension of the pastor's ministry, Paul says in verse 8, Likewise must the deacons be grave. So likewise, they have uh, similar expectations. Since they're an extension of the pastor's ministry, they're going to have similar expectations. And the first one is, likewise must the deacons be grave. That is serious, not a jester. In Ephesians 5 and verse 4, Ephesians 5 and verse 4, actually look at verse 2, Ephesians 5, 2, And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. And this filthiness and foolish talking and jesting, that's not being grave. And you say, well, what is a jester? You know, somebody that's always just joking around, never can be serious, can't hold a serious conversation. Uh, just always sarcastic. Like you sit down with them, you can't hardly talk to them. Everything you say, they they got a big smile, and a smart like looking smile on their face. They're laughing when it's not appropriate to laugh. That's not a good characteristic to have to be a deacon or a pastor. They need to be grave. They need to have some serious about seriousness about them. Nobody wants to sit and uh, be able to talk and talk to them when they can't even hold down a serious conversation. So the deacons must be grave. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued. For example, he shouldn't agree with someone to their face. And then disagree with that person in front of somebody else. That's a big one. Because that's big, you know. Maybe he's talking to the pastor. He agrees with the pastor to his face. But then he turns around and he disagrees with the pastor to somebody else. So he ends up saying one thing to him and another thing to him. And double tongue. Double tongue. That's like a tongue like a serpent. You see? like a forked tongue. Psalm two, 12 and verse 2 says, They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with a double heart do they speak. They got a double heart, so they end up with a double tongue. Say so one thing to this guy, but say a completely other thing to this guy. That's important. That you don't want to be like that for, if you're a deacon. The next one is not giving too much wine. And that throws a lot of people off because it says not giving too much wine. And <clears throat> later on in 1 Timothy, he says, he says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.23, Use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, you know, as a medicine. So, it could refer to that where it says not given to much wine. He could be referring to the fact that he told Timothy to use a little for his stomach's sake. Just like as in a medicine. <clears throat> but more than that would be in excess. 
in 1 Peter 4, 3, let me show you something there. 1 Peter 4, 3, it says, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine. You see that? The excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. You see, rioting is never good. So it says excess of riot. Rioting, no matter how much it is, rioting in and of itself is an excess. Wine, it said excess of wine. No matter how much it is, it's it's an excess. Unless it's used for thy stomach's sake, only just a little bit, like in cough medicine, something like that. But then even then, uh, he could just be referring to just new wine, regular grape juice here. So use a little wine for thy stomach's sake. And Romans 14, 21 sheds a lot of light on this as well. It says in Romans 14, 21, it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. So if you are drinking alcoholic wine, even though you're maybe not getting drunk, if your brother sees it, it can cause him to stumble or be offended or be made weak. And you don't want to do that. So it's better off not to even touch the stuff. It's hard on your testimony with the lost world as well. You know, somebody will ask me, uh, is it okay to drink alcohol? And I say, well, imagine if, if I'm in here reading the Bible all the time. You always see me in here reading the Bible all the time. And then say Friday night you go out somewhere and I'm in there drinking alcohol. What's the first thing you're going to tell everybody at work Monday? Well, he's a hypocrite. He's in here reading the Bible through the week. And then Friday night I see him out there. He's drinking alcohol. See, the lost world knows that a saved man is not supposed to drink. It's hard on your testimony when they see a saved man drinking. So it, it affects your testimony with the lost world. It affects uh, how your brothers see you, your brothers in the Lord see you, because it can make them stumble. It can make them offended. It can make them made weak. It's just best not to touch the stuff at all. So not given to much wine. And there's people that do believe that it's okay to drink as long as you don't get drunk because of much wine. But it definitely looks like to me that the excess is in the wine itself. So not given to much wine. Not greedy of filthy lucre. So not greedy of filthy lucre. It will lead... To him having respect of persons. If he's greedy of filthy lucre, then he's all about the money. And that's going to lead to him having respect of persons. Because he's going to see these people that can't give much money. And he's not going to treat them as good as he is somebody that can give a lot of money. And in James chapter 2, in verse 1, it says, My brethren... Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man with vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool, are you not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. 
Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seat, so they not blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you have respect of persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law's transgressors. See, a lot of times <clears throat> Christians get respect of persons and they have all this respect to a rich guy coming in and give him special treatment. And then they see a poor guy coming in and they just act like he's not even there and treat him worse than the rich guy that's having respect of persons. And when you're greedy of filthy lucre, you'll end up doing that because the rich people are more important to you because they're, they're giving you a bunch of money. And it shows his mind isn't on things above. He's not, he doesn't care if they're rich in faith. He cares if they're rich in their wallet. And his mind's on the temporal, not the eternal. You see, riches certainly make themselves wings. Proverbs 23, 5 says. And hopefully your pastor and deacon do not use this. Uh, Proverbs 23, 5, let's look at it. And I hope they use this correctly here. Proverbs 23, 5. It says, Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wing, wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. And I hope that your pastor doesn't use that to make you think he needs a private jet since riches make themselves wings. It's showing you that riches is a temporary thing. And greedy of filthy lucre that's a big thing today. You see all these pastors on TV. Definitely greedy of filthy lucre. You see all these big time churches around town. Very greedy of filthy lucre. It's all about the money. There's a lot of money involved. But that's should be very low on the list. Let's look at some some more verses here. Titus 1 11. Titus 1 verse 11. It says, For there, are, and this is verse 10, Titus 1 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. See, these, these guys, they're so in, in, in it for the money that they're going around teaching things that they ought not because it causes more money to come in. So when you're greedy of filthy lucre, it causes you to have respect of persons. When you're greedy of filthy lucre, it'll cause you to teach things that aren't true just to keep the money flow coming in. Now look at 1 Timothy 6.10. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. It says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The love of money is the root of all evil. And it causes them to do stuff that they never would have done as a pastor or a deacon if they hadn't been so in love with money. It causes them to err from the faith. That's a strong verse there. 1 Peter 5 and verse 2. 1 Peter 5, 2. It says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. So it says, Not for filthy lucre. You should be in this for the money. Let's look at also John 10, 12 through 13. John 10, 12 through 13. Starting in verse 11, actually. John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, Seeth the wolf coming, 
and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. You see, the hireling, the guy that's just in it for the money, he's not going to lay down his life for the sheep. He's just a hireling. So, <clears throat> not greedy of filthy lucre. That's a big one. Okay, verse 9. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. If he's holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, he's got sound doctrine. And this has to do with holding on to the right gospel. It has to do with holding on to the right doctrine. Look at Romans 16, 25 through 27. Paul says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but is now made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So Paul says, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, he said, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. Now Paul's gospel not only had to do with Jesus Christ dying on the cross, being buried and resurrected, but also to the fact that the Jews and Gentiles are now in one body when they come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And a, a deacon needs to hold the mystery of that in a pure conscience. Hold the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Look at Ephesians 3, 3 through 6. This is the mystery of the faith. Ephesians 3, 3 through 6. Paul says, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. So you see that which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Nobody knew about the Jews and Gentiles coming together in one body before until Paul came and revealed it to you. Now Paul wasn't the first one put in the body. There was people in Christ before him according to Romans sixteen seven, But Paul's the first one that revealed it, that talked about it. It says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So that's Paul's gospel there. That's his good news that Jews and Gentiles in the same body. And how do they get into the same body? By believing the gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, being buried and resurrected. And 1 Timothy 3, 9, the deacons will hold that mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 1. Look at 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 1. Paul says this, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. A steward is has someone that's been given a responsibility and they need to carry out that responsibility. And we're responsible for these mysteries. Mysteries that Paul lays out. And a deacon will hold the mystery of the faith and a pure conscience. 
He should be a faithful steward of the mysteries and doctrines that the Lord revealed to Paul for the church. And if the deacons know doctrine, they could save the flock from wolves in sheep's clothing. If, he, if, you, if he's a deacon and the pastor turns out to be a wolf, then the deacon, he knows the doctrine. He knows the pure doctrine. He could save them from the wolf. He could, uh, if the pastor get off, gets off into false doctrine, the deacon who holds the mystery of the faith and a pure conscience, he could save the flock from an apostate pastor. So, holding the mystery of the faith and a pure conscience. Then he says in verse 10, And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. So first be proved. You know, you want him to prove himself first. Don't just go making him a deacon just because you like him or because he's your best friend or something. You got to let him first be proved. And 1 Timothy 5.22 says, Lay hands suddenly on no man. On no man. That means don't be so quick to just ordain this guy to be your deacon. He's got to first be proved. He's got to prove himself. You know, uh, lay hands suddenly on no man. Let him first be proved. They could be proved in your local church. Or they could be proved before they got there in some other local church. But there should be a time of testing that went on to see what this guy is really like. And he says, let them first be proved. Then he says, let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. So he uses the office, not the people. Being found blameless, especially as the steward of God. Look at Titus 1 and verse 7. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. When it comes to him being a steward of God, when it comes to him being a deacon, he needs to be found blameless. And remember we talked about before, when it, when it referred to the pastor being found blameless, when it comes to him holding the office, he needs to be blameless. And that doesn't mean sinless. You know, if you, maybe he's messed up in the past, but if he's went to the Lord, confessed that thing, then the Lord is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If he's done something wrong to somebody else, but he's made it right with that person, then he's blameless. He's confess those things it's under the blood he can go he can go on and continue to serve god because he's blameless you know blameless doesn't mean sinless so you've wronged somebody in the past but you've went to that person and asked for forgiveness you confess that that thing to god and you're back in fellowship with god then you're blameless you know people just because they're a pastor or a deacon doesn't mean they may not mess up. They could still mess up. So, and let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Use the office, not the people. They got to first be proved, go through a time of testing, and be found blameless. They can be proved in their local church or before they got there. And then it has qualifications for the wife in verse 11. Even so must their wives be grave. You know, remember some seriousness about them when you talk to them. Not this joking around. Everything's not funny. Not everything's a joke. There's some people like that. Not slanderers. That's a big one. The deacon's wives are expected to have certain qualities. 
the pastor's wives weren't mentioned. But so they got to be grave. She should, she should take her husband's work serious. It's not a joke. It says not slanderers. As deacon's wife, a deacon's wife, she would know information that others would not know, simply because she's a deacon's wife. She could really twist information and hurt the testimony of others because of this information that she knows. So she shouldn't be a slanderer. You don't want a deacon that has a wife that could possibly be a slanderer, that can't take things serious, that's a really big busybody, because she could really take information and twist it. In Proverbs 10.18, it says, He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. You don't want her to be a slanderer. All right, the next one's sober. So she's temperate in things. Titus 2.4. Titus 2.4. It says that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. You know, what does sober mean? This is a qualification that it talks about over and over again, to be sober. You know, temperate in things, temperate and just anything that you could think of, not just over excessive in certain things. You know, soberness shows spiritual maturity, not taking things too far one way. And it does not just sober as in alcohol, but other things too, anything. So sober, temperate. And then it says faithful in all things. If she's faithful in all things, it makes it even easier for her husband to be faithful. Two working towards the same goal is a great luxury. And not everyone has this luxury. Ecclesiastes 4 9. In Ecclesiastes 4 9, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. So if you got a deacon and his wife's on the same page as he is, it's, it's a really good thing because it makes it easier for him to do the Lord's work when she's not constantly pulling him the other way. So, 1 Timothy 3.11, Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Verse 12, let, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own houses well. And remember, it's, they must be the husband of one wife, present tense, not have ever been. So you may have a man who's a good candidate for a deacon who had another wife in the past. Maybe he had another wife in the past <clears throat> and it, they were divorced over scriptural reasons and then he remarried. He's still the husband of one wife. He was divorced from his old wife. Then he was single then he got remarried. So how many wives would he currently have? He would just have one. He doesn't have two. Even if his old wife is still alive, he's, she's no longer his wife. He's the husband of one wife. He must be, present tense, the husband of one wife. As we talk, Just like we talked about when it comes to the pastor. It has to be polygamy. If it meant only one set marriage ceremony or one wedding ring or one marriage license his entire life, then you could have a guy whose wife died and then got remarried. And he would have two rings, two ceremonies, two marriage licenses, and he would be disqualified too if it only meant one marriage ceremony. But it doesn't mean that. It means... It has to be referring to polygamy, not having more than wife at one time. 
Because if a man's been scripturally divorced from somebody, he's no longer married to him. If he's no longer married to him and he gets married again, he still just has a one wife. You see what I'm trying to say? If it meant one marriage ceremony, one ring, one marriage, marriage license ever, most likely it would have read something like having been the husband of one woman. Because compare this with 1 Timothy 5.9. In 1 Timothy 5, 9, when it's talking about the widows, <clears throat> one of the qualifications for being a widow was, let, or for being um, a widow that the church would take care of, one of the qualifications is, let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man. You see that? Having been the wife of one man. If the if here where it's talking about the pastor and the deacon, if it only if Paul was only wanting them to have ever been married to one woman, most likely he would have worded it that way and said, having been the husband of one woman. But that's not what he said. He said, must be the husband of one wife. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife. Present tense be the husband of one wife, not have ever been the husband of one wife or having been the husband of one woman. He didn't say it that way. He didn't say it like he said it in 1 Timothy 5, 9. So I don't believe marriage, divorce, and remarriage disqualifies somebody. And then it says ruling their children. So ideally, a family man is best because he's going to be working with families. Now, I don't believe a, a guy is disqualified because he doesn't have a wife or doesn't have children because then that would disqualify the Apostle Paul himself. He didn't have a wife and he didn't have children. The Lord Jesus didn't have a wife and he didn't have children. So there's people who are qualified that don't have a wife or children, you see. But ideally, uh, the best candidate for it does have a wife and children most times. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. It says, for they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased themselves a good degree so they purchased themselves purchased to themselves a good degree you see when you use the office you had to give up luxuries and pleasures of this life you had to give up some things so they exchange those things for a good degree they purchased to themselves a good degree they gave up some things in exchange for a good degree that you can't earn in school. You, you can't earn this type of degree in school. And it says great boldness. You see, after you use the office for years, you get bolder in the faith. So they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. They get great boldness from experience and from the word of God. You purchase the good degree with things you give up. It says, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. You see, the, the Lord wrote the Bible to us, just as Paul wrote to Timothy and the Lord. And, and the Lord is coming shortly, just as Paul wants to come to Timothy shortly. And a, good, a common saying that they say in the South is, I'll be there shortly. Maybe that's where they get it from. So just as Paul wrote to Timothy and says he wants to come to him shortly, the Lord wrote the Bible to us, and he wants to come to us shortly. These things write I unto thee, 
hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how, to, how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Okay, let's look at some things about the house of God and the church. Let's look at Galatians 6, 10. Galatians 6 and verse 10. It says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them, that are, unto them who are of the household of faith. So the household of faith. It's the people. <clears throat> it's not a building. It's the people. Look at Hebrews 11 and verse 7. Hebrews 11, 7. It's, uh, it says, By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith, the saving of his house. His physical house got torn away, like a house of his building house but he prepared an ark for the saving of his house his people so when it says house of god it's referring to people specifically here the saved the church you see the church isn't a building the church is made up of all born again believers and if you are saved and in the body of christ you are part of the house. You are a born-again believer in the church. Okay, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Let's look at some verses on the church. Colossians 1.24 says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. The church is the Lord's body, and it's the pillar and ground of the truth. That can't be just referring to the local churches you see around you because they may not be the pillar and ground of the truth. The pillar and ground of the truth is the church, which is his body. And it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So this is a one of those mysteries here. One of those mysteries that he needs to hold, that the deacon is said to need to hold on to. Remember back there in verse 9, it says, holding the mystery of the faith and a pure conscience. And this is a mystery you need to hold on to. Hold this mystery. This mystery has to do with the fact that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. It says, and without controversy, that means we can't argue about it. This isn't something that we could, you know, agree to disagree on. To be in fellowship with Bible believers, you've got to believe that God was manifest in the flesh, that Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh. Without controversy, we can't argue over it. Great is the mystery of godliness. The fact that God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ didn't just begin in a manger. He's always been. He always will be. He's virgin born, and by being virgin born, he did not have the sin curse of Adam on him. He didn't have the sinful nature of Adam. 
he was justified in the spirit. The spirit testifies to the fact that he's sinless. He was seen of angels. You know, he got he was seen of angels at the temptation of Matthew four. Uh, the angels, uh, the Lord told the angels to worship him. He said, "Let all the angels of God worship him." The angels would have seen the Lord Jesus Christ all the way through his life and through his earthly ministry, never give in to temptation one time. The angels desire look into desire to look into the things of God about the Lord, as it talks about in First Peter. He was seen of angels when he ascended and descended. You know how the angels would uh, take took Lazarus and took him down there into the lower parts of the earth. He was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Well, when the Lord descended down into the heart of the earth, he would have been seen of angels doing that. He would have been seen of angels ascending to the third heaven. He's preached unto the Gentiles. You know, uh, went to the Jew first. They rejected the Lord. They rejected the Lord when John the Baptist was preaching them. They rejected the Lord when himself was preaching himself. And then he re they rejected the Lord in Acts 7 when they stoned Stephen. The Lord turned to the Gentiles. He's preached unto the Gentiles. Believed on in the world. How does a person get saved? By believing on him. People throughout the world have believed on him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He was received up into glory. And if he wasn't God, he wouldn't have been received up into glory. He would have stayed dead. And <clears throat> But he didn't stay dead. He resurrected. He is God manifest in the flesh. You have to believe that. That's not something we can agree to disagree on. It's a fundamental to the faith. That he's God manifest in the flesh. He didn't just begin in a manger one day. But that's the end of 1 Timothy chapter 3.